All right, well, good morning and welcome to this first session of a new series. We are undertaking the study of the Gospel of Mark, and we should probably be at it for anywhere between the next five to six months. <laughs> I would I would say probably six months or so on the Gospel of Mark. It, it may take a little, I don't think it'll take less than that, but it may take a little longer than that. So, so uh, buckle up and, and get ready for a, a fun ride through what is probably one of the more neglected gospels that uh, that we have. Um, I was not actually aware until uh, fairly recently that decades ago, <clears throat> the Gospel of Mark was not actually part of uh, of the standard lectionary followed by the uh, followed by the uh, Catholic or the mainstream Protestant churches. Um, it was only in the last few decades that Mark was added and actually uh, took, on, took on its own year, took on its own lectionary year in which it was, it was actually read through. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit uh, as this session goes on about why that is, why the Gospel of Mark has been relatively neglected uh, relative to Matthew, Luke, and John, but you may already have some, you know, some thoughts about that, some guesses as to why. Um, I think that's unfortunate. I think it's very unfortunate that Mark has been neglected uh, for a few different reasons. Um, I would say that, uh, not the least of which, is that Mark the very thing that makes Mark neglected is something is or, or a, a set of features that make Mark so distinctive, uh, because Mark is shorter than the other Gospels. You will you will note uh, it is the shortest. It is uh, sixteen chapters long. You will note uh, along the way that Mark. Uh, has very uh, abrupt, swift transitions between things, and often has shorter versions of stories than those store those counterparts in Matthew and Luke. Now, notice I said Matthew and Luke because Mark, Matthew, and Luke belong together. They belong together in what uh, in a group that the that scholars call the synoptic gospels. So the word synoptic comes from the Greek word uh, synopsis or synopsis in English, uh, <clears throat> which uh, simply means a uh, a summary, like a like a like a summary of a uh, of a longer text, and they're called the synoptic gospels because Mark, Matthew, and Luke share so much in common. They basically have the same outline of Jesus's life. Matthew and Luke, as I've already indicated, are longer, and they represent, therefore, represent later developments of the, of the evolving Christian tradition in the first century, okay? But scholars are widely agreed that Mark was the first of these Gospels to be written, of all the Gospels to be written, certainly first of the synoptics, but first period, and that Matthew and Luke used Mark in the composition of their own Gospels, which is why the basic storyline, the basic movement of Matthew and Luke are, is so similar to the basic storyline of Mark. Now, that being said, Matthew and Luke uh, do represent later evolutions of the tradition, and therefore they're going to contain elements that Mark doesn't have. They have added to Mark. They've taken the basic storyline. They've added to it. They've added according to their own agenda, their own, uh, their own interests. Um, 
and uh, their own uh, settings. And along the way, as we work our way through Gospel of Mark, we're going to note some of those places where a particular story in Mark has been taken up by Matthew and or Luke, and we will take note of what Matthew and or Luke do to Mark's original telling of a, of a particular story. We won't go into too much detail about the the total significance of those changes, but only to note that they that they do represent some some changes, do represent some additions, uh, and and perhaps briefly address why. Um, however, in the midst of all this, of doing this kind of cross comparison, it is very important that we focus all along the way on. Mark's distinctive voice, Mark's distinct, distinctive interest, and not get lost in the weeds over what Matthew and Luke did, did to it, <laughs> did to that uh, story. Um, we're going we're, we're gonna to seek out Mark's distinctive voice. Um, <clears throat> Mark is, uh, aside from being shorter, and having more, having earlier versions of a lot of stories that are familiar to us. Other than for that reason, Mark has been neglected for other reasons. And those other reasons also give us some of Mark's most distinctive features. All right. Um, as we will go through, you, you will see all of these in action. Okay. But among the distinctive features, which leads to Mark's marginalization in uh, the history of the church's worship life, Mark does not begin with a birth narrative. Matthew and Luke, you know, are very familiar to us and beloved because they do open up with the baby Jesus, told in different ways, told in some rather significantly different ways. Uh, with some different concerns in each, uh, but they do, they do give us a baby Jesus. Mark does not give us a baby Jesus. Mark assumes the baby Jesus, and he moves right on to <laughs> the proclamation of John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus in the wilderness, all right? So that's, uh, that's one thing. Also, Mark does not contain some of Jesus's most familiar teachings. There is no Sermon on the Mount in Mark, okay? There is no Lord's Prayer in Mark. There is no parable of the prodigal son in Mark. There is no parable of the Good Samaritan in Mark, okay? We will see as we go along that Mark's principal interest, that there's plenty of teaching in Mark, mind you, but that Mark is somewhat more concerned about emphasizing Jesus's action. It's a narrative that focuses more on action than on uh, lengthy teachings. Now, of course, the, the lengthy teaching business goes on steroids in, in the Gospel of John, which, you know, is not one of the synoptic Gospels. It follows a completely different pattern, has a completely different timeline, okay, than the synoptic Gospels do. And in John, Jesus, you can't, you can't get Jesus to stop talking <laughs> in John. John's, Jesus is talking all the time in John and teaching and Telling, telling the whole world uh, that he's the son of God and the, and, and, and the Messiah and all that kind of business, okay? That particular thing about the proclamation that Jesus, from his own lips, Jesus declaring himself to be the son of God, to be pre-existent, none of that, none of that is in Mark. 
That is not to say that Mark does not assume, believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah. That is, you know, in, that is implicitly on every page of the Gospel of Mark. But it is not on Jesus's lips, except in a precious few cases, but even then in private with the disciples. Okay. It's not something that is publicly proclaimed in the Gospel of Mark. In fact, it is from studies of the Gospel of Mark that we get a, a, a phrase that's uh, common in New Testament scholarship, gospel scholarship, the messianic secret. The messianic secret. That is to say, the number of times, as you will notice, the number of times that Jesus does say, does reveal to his disciples that he is uh, that he is the Messiah. It's just a few. It's not not a whole, not many times, but a, a few times where he he acknowledges his messiahship, but then he urges the disciples to keep quiet about it, to not tell anyone. Okay, that's the absolute opposite of the presentation of Jesus in the Gospel of John, in which Jesus is declaring his son of Godship, you know, all the time. <laughs> it's, it's almost like the point of the Gospel of John is that Jesus is declaring that and that it's essential you believe it. But you don't get that in Mark at all. You really don't get it at all. Um, it is also true, and this is, uh, this is a matter of, of, of some measure of debate, <laughs> Mark does not have any stories, just as he doesn't have any stories of Jesus's birth or early childhood. He also doesn't have any stories of the risen Jesus. The and this is where this is where I say there's a, there's some scholarly discussion about this about where the Gospel of Mark actually ends. Okay, if you go in your Bibles to uh, the final chapter of Mark, and we, we're not going to dwell on it right now, but, but if you look at the final chapter of Mark, uh, and especially if you have an, uh, a Bible with uh, footnotes and textual markings and whatnot, you will see that the original manuscript of the Gospel of Mark ends at verse 8. And that verses, you may have in your Bibles, you may have in chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, okay? 9 through 20, whatever exactly their provenance, their, their origin, uh, they do not appear to have been original to the gospel. They do not appear to have been part of the original text but a later addition to the Gospel of Mark because scribes, early scribes, found, <laughs> and, Mark, and Matthew and Luke arguably found Mark's ending to be unacceptable, <laughs> okay? Mark, uh, you will note that Mark 16, 8 ends with Mary Magdalene and the women leaving the tomb and being confused and afraid. Okay, having heard that Jesus was risen, but they don't. But but then it 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 ends. It ends with that word to them. But then they leave the tomb and they're confused and afraid, and thus ends the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> okay, I've actually preached on the uh, the theological significance of this earliest gospel ending that way, ending with the, the proclamation to the women, not them as proclaimers, but proclaim to, with that proclamation to them and then them leaving the tomb and not knowing what to do with it, not knowing to, what whether to believe it or not, you know, not knowing, having not actually seen the risen Jesus yet. Um, 
That appears to have been the earliest version of the Gospel of Mark. We will, when we get to that, six months from now, maybe, uh, we, will, uh, we will talk about s the significance of that and what that, what that might mean, um, especially for Mark's purposes in telling his story where and when he did. All right. Now, <clears throat> so with, with all of this and with the distinctiveness of Mark's gospel, which in part explains why Mark has been neglected as it has relative to uh, some of the other gospels, let's say, let me say something about Mark's uh, setting, date, authorship. Okay. I can say that as far as authorship, the Gospel of Mark has been, obviously, uh, attributed by church tradition to Mark, or John Mark, who was a, an associate of the Apostle Peter in Rome. Uh, there are a few uh, instances in the New Testament uh, where he is mentioned, he's mentioned in the book of Acts a few times, uh, he's mentioned in the first epistle of Peter um, as a companion of, uh, as a companion of Peter, an associate of the apostle Peter in Rome. Um, this is early church tradition. It is not in the text of the gospel. It does not, nowhere does it say in the original manuscript, this was written by Mark, <laughs> okay? The, 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 the appellation Gospel of Mark was, uh, was, was, was added or was put at the top of this gospel when during that process of these, uh, these various writings that would go on to make up the New Testament were starting to be collected. and this was referred to as the Gospel of Mark, but it doesn't say so in the text, um, and there's no unambiguous uh, clues to who did it. Um, throughout, I am going to refer to the author as Mark, but um, with the understanding that that's not a claim that this early church tradition is correct, but only just for convenience, um, rather than constantly saying, according to the author of the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> I'm just going to say Mark as a stand-in for this author who, from a scholarly point of view, is essentially anonymous. Okay, we, we don't really know. Now that said, just because we don't know the we we can't be sure of the name of the author of the Gospel of Mark, it is it is not the case that we can't say, or, it, or it's true that we we can't say for sure who exactly the Gospel of the author of the Gospel of Mark was, but we it doesn't mean that we can't be reasonably sure about uh, about the kind of person who wrote it and to whom it was written, all right? Um, I want you, if you will, I want you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. Turn to chapter five. Okay, turn to chapter five. And go to verse 41, Mark chapter 5, verse 41. This is the, uh, the context of this, of this verse is the raising of the little girl the the jewish elder comes to jesus and says you know my my daughter is dying uh you know come and help her and jesus goes to to the little girl 
And in verse 30, 41, it says, he took her by the hand and said to her, Talithakum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. Okay. Now, just uh, one little, I, I want to build up a body of work here and then, and then draw some conclusions. But one thing that's important to know is that Talitha Kum is untranslated, the words themselves, Talitha, Talitha Kum, is untranslated Aramaic, which was the standard uh, language. It was the basic language of Jesus and his and his disciples, of of Palestinian Jews, Jews living in, you know, in what was then Galilee and Judea. Okay, was Aramaic. Hebrew was more of a liturgical language, kind of uh, like many like many like really serious Roman Catholics know know a little latin not a whole lot necessarily unless they studied it extensively in school but they know a little bit just sheerly because they you know grew up with the latin mass and and that kind of thing and so in that sense in the roman catholic the serious pre-vatican II roman catholic tradition latin is a very much a liturgical language um in first century Judaism, Hebrew was a liturgical language that first century Jews, when they went to synagogue and heard the scriptures read, they would hear them read in Hebrew, okay? And so first century Jews in living in Je Galilee and Judea would have, would have understood enough Hebrew to have appreciated those readings. Okay, and certainly to appreciate it in worship. But Hebrew would not have been their first everyday language. Now, that said, Aramaic and Hebrew are closely related. They're very closely related to each other. It would be kind of like, this is a, a poor analogy, but it'll help you get your mind around what it would feel like. It would be kind of like, it would be kind of like um, being a speaker of, of Italian, of like medieval Italian, and hearing, hearing your worship services in Latin, okay? Uh, medieval Latin, obviously is heavily, heavily connected to Latin, <laughs> heavily connected, uh, you know, such that you could even, you know, you're a, a speaker of medieval Latin, you're a, you're a, Ven a Venetian in the, you know, in the 15th century, and you heard Latin in church, you could, with some modest degree of effort, you could understand every word. Okay, but Latin was not your everyday speaking language. It's kind of like that with Aramaic and Hebrew. Aramaic is related to Hebrew, uh, but Hebrew is the would be by this time a liturgical language, a scriptural language, whereas Aramaic was the everyday speaking language. Talitha Kum is Aramaic. Okay, and note that the Gospel of Mark quotes Jesus's words here in Aramaic, and then at, as soon as he does that, he then translates it, okay? Keep in mind the Gospel of Mark, as all of the New Testament is, is written in Greek, okay? So in other words, he was quoting Aramaic and then was translating it into Greek. All right, so that's important to know. Next little clue, go to chapter seven. This is what I meant uh, before class when I said, uh, when I said that uh, I would take you on a little bit of a journey of 
on of of how scholars arrive at the conclusions that they do. Okay, it's by little clues, little clues that a casual reader would not notice, but scholars notice, and they build up these clues, and then they they derive uh, what they feel to be reasonable inferences from this evidence. Okay, so look now at uh, chapter seven, and we'll just start at verse one. <clears throat> Obviously, we'll be reading all of these passages later, you know, in, in much greater detail, but uh, chapter seven, verse one, where it says, now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples uh, not live according to the tradition of the elders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Just note that. Just note that for a second. Then look at verse, uh, later in the chapter, after Jesus has this absolutely wonderful, absolutely wonderful encounter, with the Syrophoenician woman, uh, where Jesus receives a, a gentle rebuke from the Syrophoenician woman. And Jesus clearly, whatever, however else you may interpret the passage, uh, Jesus is clearly impressed with her and impressed with her comeback to his challenge to her, as we will see it later. Uh, he heals the woman's daughter, uh, uh, exercises a demon from uh, the woman's daughter. And then in verse 31, it says, then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And, there, and they brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in speech, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, now I want you, having filed that away, having thought of, thought of that a little, that stuff a little bit, I now want you to turn to chapter, um, let's see. Turn to chapter five. Look, I was considering a couple of a couple of uh, other options for making the same point. Chapter five. This is uh, the healing, as we will study later, the healing of the Gerasen demoniac. Um, and you will note that when he, when Jesus confronts this man who's been who's possessed. And in verse, actually starting in verse eight, he says, uh, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he, the demon, replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. Okay. This is a, uh, this is a of course, a Roman term, a Latin term. Okay. Uh, moving on to, uh, if you'll just file that away, take, then go to chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 12. Now, this may not be as, uh, this, in fact, won't, probably won't be as obvious. Um, um Chapter Mark chapter 10, uh, in verse 10, where Jesus is discussing divorce, and he says in chapter 10, verse 10, 
Then in the house, the disciples asked, asked him again about this matter, and he said to them, whoever divorce, divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery, okay? Uh, we will note when we study this in greater detail that Matthew and Luke, or particularly Matthew, alters this, alters this saying, and puts, uh, adds the, makes an exception, adds an exception that is not present in the Markan text, uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that unfaithfulness would make divorce okay, <laughs> make divorce allowable if there's unfaithfulness so forth, which you don't you don't get that you actually don't get that carve out that that exception here in the Mark text. What's interesting for our purposes right now is that in Jewish law, okay, in Jewish law, a woman could not initiate a divorce. Okay, a man could do it, <laughs> but a woman could not initiate a divorce, and yet here. It, it, it sounds, at least in verse 12, it sounds like a woman actually, uh, actually could divorce her husband as long as she doesn't marry another, <laughs> okay? Um, and scholars have noted, and this is, again, I'm, I'm bringing this up for a reason now, okay? We'll talk more about it later. But the reason I'm bringing it up now is that this, business, this assumption that a woman could divorce her husband as long as she doesn't marry another um, is not something that would have been allowed under Jewish law. A woman couldn't initiate a divorce, but it was permitted under Roman law. Okay, A woman could initiate a divorce under Roman law. And so, in other words, this is... This is assuming a this is basically a roman cult a, a, a culturally roman point of view okay or it assumes it in the background okay this is important when it when we go to the question when we get to the question of who wrote this the kind of person who wrote this and to whom it was written all right uh, let's see, there's one other example, but I may not. Yeah, I'm not going to won't go there, but okay. Bottom line, all of this together, what conclusions might you draw from this body of little clues hidden in the text? What conclusions might you come to about the kind of person that Mark is, the kind of author, the kind of background that the author comes from. And what is it, what does it, what do these clues suggest about the audience? Well, it gives some credence to your original statement that he might have been in Rome with Peter. Uh, he had an understanding of Roman uh, law, I guess. Uh, if he's if he's talking about uh, woman initiating divorce, uh, so uh, has exposure to Roman law. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, nobody who didn't have exposure to Roman law would would have written that verse that way. You you just wouldn't have done it unless you had some knowledge, some knowledge of Roman customs. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Yeah, what else, what else? Well, I would just guess that he's educated mm -hmm. and he seems to have a, a sort of a broad knowledge of a lot of different cultures and things. Mm -hmm. Which would suggest something very, uh, very important, 
would suggest that this was not written by one of the apostles. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would guess so. <laughs> it would suggest that it was not primarily written by one of the apostles. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you know, you, you get claims, you know, that particular, you know, like Gospel of Matthew is written by the author of the Gospel of, or the author of the Gospel of Matthew was the disciple Matthew, that kind of thing. Well, the Gospel of Matthew is called the Gospel of Matthew in exactly the same way the Gospel of Mark is called the Gospel of Mark. It doesn't say it's written by Matthew in the text. It was just attributed to. Um, and yes, this author, this author is clearly too cosmopolitan <laughs> to have been to have been one of the original one of the original apostles. Yeah. And it sounds like that he wanted these words to go far beyond just where they were. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So that suggests something about the audience then. It, it suggests that the audience is, uh, is not primarily Jewish. I mean, I mean, of Jewish ethnicity. That the audience is not, is, it, it may include Jews, certainly may include Jews, but it is not focused on Jews in the way that the Gospel of Matthew is. That's an important contrast. Gospel of Matthew is clearly written, cl I mean, very clearly written for Jews because of uh, all kinds of internal evidences that show that. Um, Mark, though, with these clues, it's it's pretty clear that Mark was writing for an audience that was not primarily Jewish, but writing for a, a group of people that was primarily not Jewish, that was Gentile, and obviously Greek speaking. Okay. Let me say one little thing about uh, about Greek and how Greek function versus Aramaic and all of that. Uh, in this first century Greco-Roman world, okay, Greek was the lingua franca of the whole Mediterranean world, okay? Um, everybody, understood at least a little Greek, at least a little bit, okay? Kind of in the way that most people, including immigrants who have been here for a little time, understand at least a little English, okay? English, between you know our experience in America, but then when you go, you know, out into the world, out into the world, there was a time when you could say that in, that English was the lingua franca of most of the world, most of the civilized world, and that was because of the British Empire and its and its you know the sun never sets on the British Empire kind of thing. English became the lingua franca, such that educated people in all lands knew English very, you know, reasonably well. And even uneducated people knew enough English to get a, to get a day job, you know, to, to get day, day labor, you know, knew enough English to, to get by. In, the, in this ancient Greco-Roman world, including the world of Jesus and his disciples, Greek would have been understood at least a little bit and could have been used at least a little bit by most people, most Jews included, okay, in, in that part of the world. Uh, Greek, however, for many peoples in the empire, Greek was not their first language, okay? It was for some people. It was for a goodly number of people. Um, but it was certainly understood at least a little bit by almost everybody. Now that said, Jesus and his and his original disciples living in, you know, Palestine were speakers of Aramaic, would have understood a little Greek, probably would have understood even less Latin. Okay. Probably would have understood even less Latin. 
Okay, now when you, you take that kind of thing into account, and you take into account, number one, this is written in Greek. It shows knowledge of Roman customs. It shows a, an awareness of Roman customs. And then the author clearly feels the need to quote something in Aramaic and then translate it into Greek says very clearly to you know to scholars who are putting these 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 clues together that the audience was not primarily jewish was not primarily uh not primarily palestinian that the primary readers or hearers of this text would have been people who were living outside of palestine Outside and by Palestine, I mean essentially what is modern day Israel. Okay, what is modern day Israel? Would have lived outside modern day Israel and would have certainly been touched by Roman customs, would not have been particularly familiar with the, the intricacies of. Jewish custom, okay, and thus the geographical explanations, where the where where Mark is is saying that so and so was near so and so, which was near so and so, as we saw a second ago, um, you know, if if the if if Mark was writing for a <coughs> principally Palestinian Jewish audience, he wouldn't have he wouldn't have said that. He wouldn't have needed to say that. He was adding all this, and then that stuff about the what the Pharisees' customs are. You know, he was clearly writing for people, mostly for people who were not speakers of Aramaic, were not familiar with the intricacies of of Jewish uh, Jewish purity laws and whatnot. Um, and yet, he shows enough familiarity with Jewish customs. Okay, he shows enough familiarity with Jewish customs. He himself is not ignorant of Jewish customs. He's probably, he is most likely a Greek speaking Jew, a Jew not living in modern day Israel, <laughs> Jews in the diaspora, where their first, where Mark's first language probably is Greek. Okay, his first language probably is Greek, but he lives outside of modern day Israel, and his audience then is principally not Palestinian Jewish. That explains why he explains the things he does, he translates the things he does. He's probably a Jew, a Greek speaking Jew who lived somewhere else in the empire. <laughs> Scholars have offered that he may have lived in Syria, may have been a Greek-speaking person of Jewish ethnicity, uh, Greek-speaking Jew uh, living in Syria. He might, might have lived in, in, in Rome or near Rome. We don't know. That part we don't know. But we, but we can gather these clues together and conclude certain things. Um, this is in marked contrast, marked, marked contrast, marked contrast to Matthew, who is clearly Jewish, clearly a Greek speaking Jew, but clearly Jewish and writing to Jews. Okay, that's not Mark's primary audience. All right. Um, <clears throat> It is pretty clear when it was written, okay? There are a few internal clues that give us a pretty good idea of when this was written and, frankly, the setting in which it was written. Um, hand in hand, with the reticence 
of Jesus to declare his messiahship publicly, to keep it private, is a heavy emphasis in Mark on Jesus's knowledge that his path was the path of the cross. His path was the path of suffering, that he was going to suffer. He was going to be persecuted. He was going to be confronted by the powers of the day. And with that, those who would follow me, Jesus, those who would follow me must accept the same reality. Okay. That has to, that clear emphasis in Mark, that very clear emphasis in Mark, has suggested to many scholars an atmosphere of tribulation among the followers of Jesus to whom this gospel was written, okay? In other words, that Mark was writing in a time of persecution and tumult, strife, of, of great suffering and challenge. And he is emphasizing Jesus's emphasis of this as a call to faithfulness, as a call to steadfastness in the face of this trouble, okay? Now, I have said on any number of occasions in previous Bible studies and in, certainly in Ali classes and whatnot, I have said that in the first century, that persecution of Christians was not with the, was generally not uh, empire-wide. That persecution of Christians tended to be more local, okay? That uh, a particular Christian community might run afoul of local customs or sensibilities, and a local Christian community might come under fierce persecution, you know, in their place, in their community might come under serious persecution. But it was generally not something that happened just all over everywhere. There were a goodly number of Christian communities that lived very, I mean, very much lived with a, you know, an ever-present sense of their, of their separateness, you know, of their being different from the surrounding world. Um, but <coughs> more or less, <coughs> more or less lived in their place, uh, you know, with a relative, in, in relative peace, okay? And in some ways, there was some temptation in the part, you know, in the part of some Christian communities to make that easier, to make their living at relative peace easier by accommodating to local, local customs, okay? And it's, you know, for example, in the late first century diatribe, that is the book of Revelation, we see uh, in like, for example, the seven, the seven messages of the spirit to the churches, we see a mixed bag of, spirit, of the spirit's messages to those seven churches. Some of those churches are under, you know, fierce persecution. And the message to them is, you know, to stand fast, to be faithful, to, you know, to, you know, to stand true to the gospel. But others, you will remember, others are not under persecution. In fact, what they're, what they're criticized for is accommodation to 
the surrounding culture, that they've become so like the surrounding culture that no one, it would not occur to anyone to persecute them, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, so in other words, I, I say all this to say that some Christian communities had it easy, had it relatively easy, or at least they, they found a way to live in relative peace with their surroundings, whereas other Christian communities did experience persecution. What's clear from the Gospel of Mark is that Mark is right, clearly writing to Christians who are experiencing, uh, experiencing tribulation. Okay. This is something that would favor a Syrian interpret a Syrian interpretation of place. It's not likely that the audience was principally living in Palestine, but probably living not terribly far away from it either. In that in that uh, the troubles of the people of Palestine could be felt by people, especially by Jews who were Greek-speaking Jews who were living in Syria. Um, that's why some scholars favor a Syrian, a Syrian audience, the Syrian, a Syrian audience that is made up of a mix of Jews and Gentiles. Okay. That would explain a number of things, if that's if that's so. Uh, <laughs> so it is so it is probably in a time of persecution and trouble. Question. Yeah. Uh, so if you if you would set this in Syria, would we think then that Mark was Syrian? Yeah, he may, he may very well have been. He, and his name probably wasn't Mark. <laughs> he was Syrian. Well, no, no. He was probably, uh, that was actually not an uncommon name in the right. Greco-Roman okay. world. He was probably, probably a person of Jewish ethnicity who was not native to Palestine. I see. Okay. He was not native to Galilee or, or Judea. Um, and therefore was probably, um, was probably probably spoke Greek as his first language. In this respect, he would be similar to Paul. Remember, Paul was not native to Galilee or Judea. He was native to Tarsus, which was up north, up towards Turkey, okay? Sort of in that armpit of, <laughs> of, of Syria and Turkey, about where they come together. Tarsus is near there. Uh, Paul's first language would have been Greek, okay? Uh, and Paul, because he was from where he was, his world was much bigger. He had a bigger world. He had other people in view. He was certainly aware of Jews in Palestine, but he was also aware of the Roman world, aware of Roman customs and Greek language and uh, other peoples. And in that way, this author, Mark, was probably, probably um, a person of Jewish ethnicity, like Paul was a person of Jewish ethnicity, but living outside Palestine, possibly in Syria. That would explain a number of things. It would also explain, though, his consciousness of persecution, his consciousness of trouble, not necessarily because the Christian community to which Paul, to which Mark, Mark was writing, was under direct duress, but might suggest a proximity of those people to where the big trouble was. And what is that big trouble? That big trouble was the trouble that was engulfing both Jews and Christians in Jerusalem when the Romans came. <clears throat> um, for internal reasons, scholars usually date the Gospel of Mark to right around the year 70, somewhere between possibly, a, possibly 68 or 69 round about the first and second sieges, Roman sieges of Jerusalem, 
during the Jewish War, which began, or the revolt began, in the year 66, about 66, 67, okay? This is after Nero. You know, of course, Nero had his persecution of Christians, persecuted Christians, um, during his reign, but his reign was in the late 50s into the early 60s AD. Uh, that persecution was largely, largely restricted to Rome itself, okay? But we know from, uh, from history that Paul was in Rome at that time. Paul probably, although we don't have any firm, uh, firm stuff, stuff there, we, we have good reasons to believe that Paul died as a consequence of the persecutions of Christians in Rome um, in, those, in those years of Nero's reign. Uh, it is highly likely, and certainly in accordance with Christian tradition, that the apostle Peter died at about the same time, round about that same time. Um, but then following the death of, following the death of Nero, round about the year 66 or 67, a Jewish revolt rose up in, in, in Jerusalem. And, uh, and it was fueled by, um, by Jewish nationalism, by Zionist, Jewish Zionist nationalism to rid themselves of the Roman yoke, okay? And this caught up <laughs> Jews living throughout what is modern-day Israel, and it caught up a lot of Christians, caught up a lot of Christians in the same, in the same struggle, okay? Uh, <clears throat> the Roman siege of Jerusalem or the Roman sieges of Jerusalem uh, in starting in about 68, 69 or so were enormously devastating, enormously devastating. There was an enormous uh, loss of life. Hundreds of thousands of Jews and others, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people died during this, during this period, okay? It was a time of terrible, terrible tribulation. And whether directly or indirectly, it would have been felt by Christians in Syria. This is why I'm offering Syria as maybe perhaps the most likely, most likely uh, audience, um, but would have been very much felt. There would have been certainly a lot of pressure on Jews, on Jews in Syria, including Jewish Christians, for in Syria to leave Syria and come down and take part in the rebellion against Rome, okay? To take part in the defense of Jerusalem, right? There would have been a lot of kind of patriotic, Zionist patriotic pressure to do so. Tom, I can't remember the name of the mountain. Was this when they retreated to this mountain and had this long sea? Yeah, it's during this war. Yeah, it's during the yeah. Jewish war in Masada. The fortress, yeah, 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 yeah. That's an interesting story. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, it's a, it's a fascinating story. This, that is, and it, and that is part of the story of the Jewish war, the Jewish revolt against Rome in this time. Uh, the, uh, the bottom line is, is that in the year seventy, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. It was. I mean, it was like. It was the closest thing to a complete and total, in the modern sense of the word, apocalypse. <laughs> in the ordinary use, common use of the word apocalypse, it was a Jewish apocalypse. The Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. It, it had, it was a time of un, just unreal suffering for the Jewish, for the Jewish people. And as, I mean, Jews all over the empire looking on this event with incredible sorrow, incredible sadness, and, and, and I mean, just all that the destruction of the temple meant to Jews all over, all over the empire. It would have just been a horrible, horrible event. Um, hundreds of thousands of Jews and others died during, during this time. 
Um, now I will say, uh, let me say uh, one thing, one thing in addition that uh, is important for a later understanding of Christian history and the development of Christian Jewish relations. It was with the destruction of Jerusalem and the aftermath of that, that the apocalyptic understanding of God's miraculous intervention and ushering in the kingdom in a dramatic Rome overthrowing sort of way, but that worldview began to wane and gradually disappear as a consequence of this event <laughs> for reasons that maybe aren't hard to understand. If ever, if ever God was going to intervene <clears throat> and usher in the kingdom, Rome overthrowing kind of kingdom, if ever God was going to do that, he should have done it. He should have done it right around the year 70. Because, I mean, what better time to have done that? And when that didn't happen, it came to be seen as a kind of, you know, how, how often we hear people predict the end of the world and they even give you an exact date as to when it happens, when it's going to happen. And of course, the day comes, the day goes, nothing happens. And you begin to lose faith. Over time, you begin to lose faith in these date setters. <laughs> you may still hold on to the hope one day, sometime, somewhere, sometime, somewhere, you know, <laughs> at some point that that will happen. But you do lose the, the imminent sense that that could happen at any moment, right? You, you, you lose that sense. That sense vanishes. And you begin to, as it were, settle in. <laughs> You, you you begin to settle in for the long haul. You may theoretically believe it could still happen down the line, but you don't actively live in that everyday expectation. You're kind of settling in for the long haul and, and starting to, you know, build communities and form institutions and, and that kind of thing. Okay. The apocalyptic mindset began to wane after this time. Scholars believe they can date this gospel to about the year 70, partly because of the trouble and the tumult that seems to be assumed by the author in the text, but also <clears throat> because the changes that Matthew and especially Luke make to Mark's account of Jesus predicting the fall of Jerusalem, the changes that they make show an awareness that Mark does not seem to have, an awareness about how that event panned out. an awareness that it didn't pan out the way so many people had hoped it would. Matthew and, and, and even more Luke show an awareness of that fact. And when we get to, Mar to Mark chapter 13, and we start going through that chapter, you will see the way Mark tells the story. And then we'll see how Matthew and Luke take the same basic story, but alter some of the details. And, you, and you'll see where Matthew and Luke show an awareness that Mark doesn't have. And that clearly, in, in the minds of, of, of mainstream scholars, that clearly dates the, the writing of the text to this period of the Jewish war against Rome. It's both, it explains both the, the tribulation that, that, every, that everyone seems to be experiencing and explains why Mark tells the story the way he does versus the way Matthew and Luke tell the same story. Okay? 
All right. So with all of that as prelude, we are now ready next week to begin our study of Mark chapter one. Uh, Mark chapter one, verse one, which we, as we will see, begins with not a birth narrative, but rather with the proclamation of John the Baptist in the wilderness. And with that, we will begin next week. All right. Are there, for now, are there any questions or thoughts that anyone has? Just that that was a wonderful presentation that you ah, did. Thank you. An introduction. Thank you. I am very enthusiastic about this subject matter, as I am about all biblical subject matter. Uh, but uh, but yeah, this is uh, this is this is good. This is really good stuff. It's very important to understand, I think, because 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 then you can hold it in your in the back of your mind as we read through the text, and things will there are going to be things that will make more sense now. Now that you have that back, uh, it will explain a lot. And um, and so so this should be, this should be a great adventure as we go through. Um, all right, okay. So um, one, one more thing, and this is off yeah. off subject a little bit. Uh -huh. Just uh -huh. listening to you go through the thing about the persecution of the Jews during that time, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, all right, so that's when they decided Jesus wasn't coming back immediately. And then you fast forward to the Holocaust, and and my thought about the whole thing is. How in the hell can these people even continue to believe anything? You know, I just, I so admire the Jewish people, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. almost like God chose them to just throw all his crap out through history. And I don't see how they, how they maintain their faith. I mean, it just really breaks my, my heart in a way. But yeah. I have such admiration for them. Right, right. Uh, I, you know, uh, I just announced this uh, last week, but um, next term in Ali in February, I'm going to be offering a six-week series on the theological problem of evil, the, the problem of unjust mm -hmm. suffering, and be looking at classic resources uh, to address I'll take that. that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I hope you will. I need that. And uh, and uh, one of the authors that uh, that we're going to look at is uh, Elie Wiesel, uh, who is such an eloquent writer on the Holocaust and and on on his personal experience of Auschwitz. And he tells a wonderful story in his book Night. Yeah, I read that part, part of the Night trilogy, but a wonderful story in which a group of a group of Jews. <laughs> in the concentration camp, hold a, hold a trial, a trial of, for God, in which God is on trial. And God is accused of not, not looking after the people, not upholding his end of the covenant, his end of the bargain. And they put him on trial and they find him guilty and then when the trial is over, they return to their prayers. Mm -hmm. They return to their, they, they, they put him on trial, they put God on trial, they judge him guilty, and then they return to their prayers. It's, and so it's just this, this incredible spirituality. Later, later you know, in later, uh, after, after the 1940s, um, there was a line of thought called a theology of protest in which theolog in which theologians who were writing in this vein um, and including Jewish theolo I'm not just talking about Christian theologians I'm talking about Jewish theologians would 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 write uh, would would think of the spiritual life as a as a, a life that lives in that tension between, the protest of injustice, including divine injustice, and the worship of God lives in that tension, uh, very much in the spirit of Job, very much in the spirit of Job, who is, you know, spends most of the book <laughs> protesting the injustice of his situation. 
uh, and, and that he absolutely does not deserve what he's getting. And, and you know, you jerk, you divine jerk, you know, how dare you do this kind of thing? And, uh, and, and yet he never, in the midst of that protest, he never curses God. He never abandons God. And at the end of the, and then of course, at the end of Job, if you read the final chapter, you know, God shows up and basically tells, I mean, he humbles Job. He shows up and he humbles Job, kind of puts Job in his place a little bit. You know, Job, you? you're kind of saying more than you know. You know, you're saying you're, you're making assertions beyond what you really understand. But, but he has, God's harshest words are not for Job at all, but for Job's friends who spent most of the book attacking Job and defending God. Mm -hmm. And God has his harshest words against them. Yes. Okay. And then says that, you know, jo I'm going to ask Job to make a sacrifice so that I will forgive your sins because you have not spoken of me that which is right as my servant Job had. Oh my word, that's incredible. That's just a that is an amazing ending. An absolutely amazing ending. And it and it really does just uh, uh, illustrate beautifully this spirit of protest, which which I think very much lives on. It has always been present, at least in some capacity, in Judaism, and especially in post-Holocaust, post-Holocaust Judaism. And I, think not, you know? yeah. and I think it's a, and I think it's a spirituality that Christians would do well to learn from, mm -hmm. would really do well to learn from. So, uh, so anyway, with that, um, let's close with prayer. I am, uh, I'm very shortly headed off to, to uh, lunch. I, I love the fact that I get to have lunch with, with awesome, smart people. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so often I get to, I get to have lunch. I, I, I lunch with, uh, I lunch with, with Sarah and Lois, one of these days, you and I are going to have lunch. We've we got to do, we got to do lunch and bring Bill along. And uh, I, I love that. I'm having a lunch with a, a professor, an English professor at the university um, who is a Tolkien scholar. Uh, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. I'm looking forward to just picking his brain and, and, and this kind of thing and, uh, possibly, possibly down the road, um, uh, doing some kind of, doing some kind of event. Uh, you say a Tolkien scholar? Tolkien, Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings. Isn't that uh, an oxymoron? <laughs> <laughs> what part? Scholar. What part? <laughs> oh, scholar, Tolkien scholar, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's, uh, he is, oh, you'll love this, Bill, you'll appreciate this, he, uh, he is, um, he's actually published, he, he's primarily a professor of, of Anglo-Saxon, uh, of Old English in uh, the English department, uh, but he has published on Tolkien's invented languages for uh, the Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings, and I'm and I'm I'm reading this on this faculty page, and I'm like, I have got to meet this guy. I have got to meet this person. And so I reached out to him, and he seemed he seemed very interested, very interested in meeting me. Uh, so uh, so I'm having lunch with him today, and I'm, I look forward to making a new friend. And so yeah, yeah. And Sarah, I very much look forward to seeing you on Thursday. And. Uh, and uh, and Phyllis, if, if if I get back to Atlanta, I'd love to have lunch with you. <laughs> and I love I love having uh, I love eating with my folks too. And uh, and Bill, you too. If I ever get back to Carrollton, would love to certainly love to be be with you and you and Sharon both. But anyway, all right. Well, let's uh, let's let's uh, have a final prayer, and then we'll uh, we'll 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 go on. Lord, we thank you for this day, this opportunity to begin a new study of this, of this wonderful gospel that is the gospel of Mark. Uh, we thank you for Mark's distinctive voice, distinct setting and message. And we pray that as we go through the next, go through the text over the next several months, that you open up our ears to hear that message to to receive it and and to hear your spirit speaking to us 
even today, in our own time, in our own situations, uh, through this, through these ancient words. And so we now lift up to you all those who have asked for our prayers, all those who are very much in need of your healing touch, of your of your peace and your grace in this time. We we lift up to you all those uh, all those people now. We also lift up to you the uh, the people of Ukraine and and their struggle for freedom and for survival against a uh, against an oppressive power and we pray that that you stand with them and, and bring healing and, and restoration to that nation and for all people we pray all people who live in the midst of war and terror we pray we pray lord have mercy and so now we pray these all these things now in the strong name of jesus christ amen all right everyone well, have a great rest of your day, and uh, and I will look forward to uh, seeing you next week. All right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay. And uh, mom and dad, real quick. Yes. Hey, before I go, I do have to go in a second, but I do want to uh, wish you once again a very happy, I hope your anniversary was was very happy and very good. Wow. It was, and it, it was so cute last night. We went to dinner, and we had seen this play. I, I think I told you we was we were seeing this play over at the university on Sunday afternoon, and it was called Detroit '67. Now it it did have music, but it was it, it was a dramatic play about what all was going on in Detroit. And I